Hello, so what we're going to be doing today is um, going over mutualism. So this is going to be your part three, okay? So um, part three is going to be focusing on just mutualism. This is going to be done on your own time, right? Uh, this is why you're watching this video. So you can go over mutualism. You can rewind. You can fast forward a little. You can rewatch. You can pause. You can stretch. So there's a lot of things you can do um, during this video. Okay? Make sure you take notes, though. All right. So we did cover these symbiotic relationships, um, just a few of them. We've covered parasitism. Uh, we did that uh, during a Zoom meeting. And we um, also went over commensalism through ed puzzles. OK, so you're going to be doing a few ed puzzles um, to go over commensalism. So just to kind of recap here, um, we have um, symbiotic relationships. These are relationships where uh, species have a close interaction. OK, so they need to be uh, touching each other. They're in close proximity to one another and their interactions between members of two different species. OK, this is your scientific uh, definition. So we covered parasitism where we had a few examples where um, some species benefited and one species was harmed. So species one was benefited, had benefits in the relationship, and it cost the other one um, to be in that relationship. Now, if it ends up costing the species its life, ultimately, you see that asterisk on here. So see, there's this asterisk on here. Um, oops. All right, so let me get a pen color here. So. Yeah, so there we go. All right. All right, my pen's now <laughs> working. OK, so we have that asterisk you see right there by parasitism. And it says this can be considered a type of predation down here. OK, so this is what it's referring to. Um, so we have parasitism. If it ends up costing the organism its life in that relationship, then parasitism becomes predation because now the life is over. There is no longer a symbiotic relationship. The, 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 the relationship has ended because one consumed the other. So um, and the other one is now dead. So but what we're focusing on today is mutualism. Commensalism you learned in Ed Puzzles um, where one species benefits and the other one isn't harmed or has any benefits. It just it, there's no effect whatsoever. OK, so you're covering those in Ed Puzzles on um, that website. OK. But this asynchronous learning video, um, we're going to be covering mutualism. All right. So mutualism is where one species benefits and the other spe species benefits too. But that doesn't mean that there aren't costs in the relationship. It's just better to be in the relationship and both species benefit more than they have costs. OK, so it says, why isn't predation included here? So you want to think about that for a moment. So look at the definition, close interactions between members of two species. So predation, if you're thinking that predation isn't included because one is now dead, um, that is that is the reason one has lost its life. So it's gone. There's no more relationship. It's dead. You can't be in a relationship when one or one of the species is gone. OK. All right. So what is mutualism? So true mutualism is where the benefits outweigh the costs for both partners. So you're going to be in the relationship where both of you have benefits, but you also might be giving some something in the relationship, but they outweigh the costs. OK, so any benefits? Yes, there are benefits. Any costs? Yes, there are costs as well. OK, they both exist. But the benefits definitely outweigh the cost. So there are more benefits than costs. Okay. 
Now, there's two different types of mutualism um, relationships out there. Okay, so we have a facultative and we have obligate. Okay, so facultative and obligate. So facultative is where, um, let me move my head, my video here. Okay. So um, facultative is where you have um, each mutualistic species can live without the other. We are actually doing this for this class. Um, we're going to be so, okay. Um, it says each mutualistic species can live without the other. All right. So um, if one can live without the other, that one that can live without the other is said to be in the facultative. Um, instead of having these relationships where you have one being facultative and one being obligate, that would be for more. If you were to move on in uh, science, you'll You'll go over this and it'll be a little more specific, but for this class, since you're learning general biology, um, we're going to just basically say that a facultative mutualism is where each species can live without the other. Now that's still facultative, like the word facultative and mutualism is still referring to one that can live without the other. It's just better to be in the relationship, but we're going to say that it's for both. Okay. Just to um, make this a little more um, simpler. Uh, to cover. Obligate. So when you're obligated to do your chores, right, you have to do them. So um, you want to think about obligate mutualism is that where each species cannot survive without the other. They have to be in the relationship in order to survive. So the benefits are, are basically survival. Um, it could be that the nutrients aren't available through another means. Um, it could be that um, they just rely on each other so much. Um, one could be offering protection to the other. Um, and that's the only way it survives. So we're going to go over several examples. Um, this is basically your slide where we define it. We learn about the two, and then I'm going to be going over some examples, and you will be um, kind of practicing which one you think it is, facultative or obligate, right? You got to practice this over and over so you can get it. All right, so... We have two types of mycorrhizae. Um, what is this? This is basically a root fungus. That's all mycorrhizae is, okay? It's a root fungus. And we have plants out there. It says 95%, 95%, that's crazy. That's a lot um, of the plant species form associations with mycorrhizae. So that means that pretty much every plant you see has fungus in its roots, but it wants the fungus to be there and the fungus wants to be there. Okay. So, um, now a lot of the time, some plants, um, you know, they can, they can get nutrients just fine. Um, but this type of relationship, it's just really great to have this, this type of relationship because what happens is the fungus provides nutrients for the plants. It can go really, really, really far that the plant roots cannot go. Um, root fungus or you know basically fungus can spread out like a web and go all over the place it could take up a whole bunch of area underground where it could be football fields worth it can be blocks down the street um it could take up an entire island um so uh, just saying that there is a lot of area that these roots can get to um if they have the fungus going the distance for them so they can take the nutrients from other areas that the plant roots cannot reach okay so that is key so um this is definitely a beneficial relationship the fungus what it gets out of it is some sugar so the plant actually gives it um, some sugar that it makes and the fungus gets kind of like a free meal, basically. Um, so they really like to be with one another. We're going to call this facultative mutualism. They can, um, the roots can get nutrients on their own. The fungus can technically get nutrients on its own by absorbing um, sugars from another means. Um, but it is better to be in this relationship. So better that it is in the majority of plants. 95%, you guys. There's a lot of plants out there that have this association. Okay. All right, so 
meet the acacia tree and the ants that actually live in the acacia tree super sweet um so this is the larvae these are the little babies of the ant okay um that's basically um the arrows pointing to these little structures here okay these are your actual baby ants okay uh, that's what larvae is it's just babies um, of flies of ants of all kinds of different things wasps um, so uh, the bull sh those bulls horn acacia hollow thorn so acacia trees have these huge thorns this is inside the thorn of the acacia tree so these ants are actually putting these babies inside the thorn so what do you think they're getting by having their babies inside this thorn? What do you get for being inside a house, right? Or inside a tent or inside a cave? So what you're getting is protection from the outside, right? Um, the outside elements, the environment, the rain, the snow, um, predators, right? So there's protection there. And what do the ants get? So the acacia tree, what they do is uh, the acacia tree actually provides um, sugar. So let me move my head here. Um, so this extra floral nectary, so these little things here, these little structures here, okay, uh, those actually drip out sugar. Okay, so actually sugar comes out of there and ants love sugar. They're little sugar fiends. So they'll um, uh, lick up all the sugar and the plants actually supplying this. So it's working out, making sugar through photosynthesis and supplying and giving it's giving some sugar out um, to the ant. So this is costing the plant to do this. Okay. Um, then there's also these little Belshin bodies, these Belshin bodies. These are like fat bodies. Um, this is going to give them the ants. It's like uh, fat and uh, protein. OK, so it's going to have um, all of its nutrients on the plant. It doesn't have to go anywhere. They have um, they have protection for their young and themselves, and they also have food so they don't have to go anywhere. But what does the plant get out of all of this? OK. So this is to show you some predators. Um, some of them are large predators. That is a large, um, I'll say that um, of the plant, this is an herbivore. Um, it does eat a lot of the acacia tree um, leaves to the point where it could wipe out the entire plant, okay? So um, also I want you to notice here, this is an acacia tree right there. But look at this area, okay? Look at that area right there super cleared out. It looks like somebody went into the forest and raked the leaves. This is a natural forest and nobody grooms this area. The ants actually groomed all around the acacia tree. It took away all the leaves around the plant. It swept the area and allowed for the um, plant to have a whole bunch of space. What else do they do? They also, if any spider tries to get onto the plant and, you know, make a web to try to collect other, you know, um, prey, um, they'll bite the spider so it can go off. Um, any grasshopper that lands on the plant, anything that lands on the plant, the plant, the ants will actually attack them. Um, I was in Costa Rica and I tapped on an acacia tree. And within seconds, the ants were, were just aggro. Like, they're so mad. They're like, who's messing with my acacia tree? Um, so they came out and they're like, what the heck is going on? Um, who's messing with the acacia tree and tapping on this? Um, so they're really mad. They're ready to attack. So they protect the acacia tree from all kinds of stuff. Um, and they noticed that if you took away the predators and all the things for the acacia tree, the acacia tree actually makes its thorns smaller and doesn't provide a lot of sugar or um, protein to the ants um, because now they don't really have um, a use. Um, but in areas where there's predators or herbivores or anything that's trying to mess with the acacia tree, it wants the ants on its side. So they are both getting a lot from this relationship. So the question is, can they live without the other? Technically, yes, um, the acacia tree can, and so can the ants. They can live just fine getting their own food um, and living their life just fine. 
But being in the relationship is a lot better than not being in the relationship, which is the mutualistic part. So what kind of mutualism is this? Um, that would be, um, this would be facultative. Okay, so if you thought facultative, you're right. Um, so this is just to show you how much the ants help the acacia tree. So look at the acacia height. So on the um, Y axis here, right, we have acacia height. So the acacia tree is growing um, nice and tall. Um, and if it gets super tall, it, it gets pretty tall over time. So the date you can see on the X axis is the date. And over time with ants, look how tall it gets. It gets to be about 110 centimeters, pretty good. Um, without the ants, it doesn't even grow that much. Look at that, it's like 18. I mean, it's 100 centimeters more with the ants than without. I mean, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot, that's a big difference. Now let's look at the ants um, and the abundance of herbivorous insects on the bull horn, bull's horn acacia. So you can see that the acacia plant without the ants have a much larger number of uh, herbivorous insects. So this is telling you how many insects are there. Well, without the ants, there's a whole bunch. Look at all those. With the ants, there's not that many. Okay, so um, they really, bite at them and get rid of them. So they're really attacking anything that goes on that acacia tree, okay? Uh, so here's another one. Um, these ants, there's a lot of um, insect um, examples. There's a lot of mutualistic examples out there, but I like to choose insects because um, that is one of my favorite um, categories. I actually know a lot about insects and species and stuff. So um, it's like my specialty field. Um, ecology, botany, and entomology. So that would be your insects, okay? Um, so we have this ant and this little aphid, okay? So this is a little aphid. Um, so what it's doing is it's nudging its butt. And if you see here, there's actually a little, let me erase that so you can see. So if you look very, very closely, so look very, very closely there, you'll see a little droplet coming out of the aphid. And what aphids do is they have these really pointy mouth parts and they suck the sugar out of the plant. And they're basically tapping into the sugar system, the sugar vessel of the plant and um, taking out its sugar. And then their excess sugar, they actually emit out of their rear. It's, there's too much, so they emit it, right? Um, and um, ants, what they'll do is they'll nudge them and the, the little aphid will be like, oh, here's some sugar, don't eat me. Um, <laughs> because uh, ants can't eat the aphids. Um, but what they do is they actually farm them. They'll get a whole bunch of aphids and let them reproduce and grow and they can reproduce, okay? They are the... They are specialists and professionals at reproducing, okay? Um, there's a whole thing uh, during my evolution um, lecture or um, that will cover where I go over the aphid uh, life cycle. Super cool. Um, so what happens is the ants, um, sometimes they do eat a couple of them for protein, but the ants get, uh, get to protect the aphids. So the aphids, what they get out of the relationship is mostly protection. So a lot of them are protected. You want ants on your side. They are crazy. <laughs> they will protect um, their aphids. So anything that tries to attack them, any predator. So here is a predator. Natural predator is the ladybug. Um, most of the time the larvae eat aphids, but some of the adults do too. Okay, so they both eat aphids. Um, but you know, they're, they're, they're both predators. So your little lady um, bug, which is actually a beetle, um, will eat the aphids. Um, so if you really have a big problem, you wanna release some ladybugs nearby. So make sure they're near the aphids um, so they see them and they know that there's food. So um, there's what they get out of the relationship. And the ants get to have um, a big old nice sugar source because they are sugar fiends. They love their sugar. So what kind of mutualistic type is this? So do you think the aphids can live alone? Yes, they can. Do you think the ants can live alone? Yes, they can. So then what is it? Okay, so hopefully you thought facultative. Okay, so that one's facultative. 
All right, so here's another um, example. It's very close to the aphids, but this one, there's two ants that'll actually protect this little lichenid uh, caterpillar, okay? So um, there can be one, but usually there's two that are kind of hanging out, okay? There, there can be one. Um, and the, the caterpillar will actually excrete um, some sugar out of it. They Basically, ant payment is sugar. They get paid by getting sugar by, for all their work, okay, <laughs> or protection. So what they do is they this um, lichenid is actually a blind caterpillar, and it's actually pollinating. So it's eating um, right now. It's, it's pollinating, and it's also getting fed, okay? Um, so it gets protection from the ants. It gets guided by... Um, with the ants. Um, so anything that's trying to eat the cat, uh, the caterpillar, which a lot of predators are out there to eat the caterpillar, the ants will attack it um, and they will protect as much as they can this caterpillar um, throughout its life, actually, until it um, turns into a butterfly. So these ants are basically its little bodyguards, which is super cool. Um, now, a lot of the time, the lichenid um, it can survive without the other, but it doesn't do that well. Um, it really doesn't do that well. Um, it gets pretty much taken out, um, but it could technically survive without the ants and the ants can survive without the lichenid. So it's mostly facultative. Um, if you wanted to argue um, just because the survival rate of the caterpillar isn't as great, um, without the ants, because I mean, it is blind. It's not really that great um, by itself. And it does get eaten a lot by a lot of things. So um, technically it's facultative, but uh, the caterpillar could have an obligate. Um, but since we're doing, can they both live without each other? The answer is yes, both of them can. Um, so actually this is still going to fall under facultative for my class. Okay. All right, so here's a, we're just going through some examples, you guys, okay? So um, here's another one. This is um, a very large clam. You could see somebody's diving in the water right there. That's how big that clam is. And the zooanthellae, that's actually an algae, okay? So all of that, all of that blue color you see, super nice and pretty. Um, it's it's um, nice and bright blue. It's bioluminescing. Um, very, very beautiful. Um, that's actually the algae and it lives under the skin of the giant clam. So basically it's, it's getting um, protection, okay, inside that clam. So the zooanthellae is getting protection and the clam is um, actually what the algae is doing is it's eating the waste that the clam makes. So it actually takes the waste um, keeps it clean um, and consumes the waste of the clam. Um, so they're both getting um, some benefits there, right? Now, the clam could technically live without the zooanthellate algae. Um, and the zooanthellate, it, it usually is found in the clam, um, but zooanthellate can be found on other things. Um, so it can survive without the clam. Um, so we're going to go with facultative for this one too. So, so far we've had a lot of facultative, okay? This class. Okay. Now, there's a whole bunch of other mutualisms, which you may not have thought was mutualism. Um, so we have these pollinators out there. So the, the honeybee goes all over the place. It's actually what you call a generalist pollin pollinator. It goes all over to different flowers. It's not a specialist. It can go to many flowers. So um, a lot of plants are pollinated, right? They get the benefit of having more babies, which is what they want. Um, and honeybees um, go around from plant to plant helping pollinate. Um, when they go to the same species and a different individual, they get to pollinate that other flower, right? So that other flower of the of the, spe the same species, okay? So it gets pollinated. Um, the honeybee gets pollen. So they're both mutualistic. Um, now, um, a lot of the time, since since it is a honeybee that's going from flower to flower, um, these flowers are not pollinated by wind. They're pollinated by pollinators. Um, you do need an insect to go on there. So really, um, the honeybee can live without specific flowers. But for this class, we're going to say that this is obligate just because um, flowers do need to be pollinated by pollinators. And honeybees need some pollen 
um, to help feed their young. Okay, so they do need the pollen themselves. Now, the relationship, the specific relationship of a honeybee on this particular flower would not be um, fac um, obligate. It would be facultative. But we're just going to say that pollination and pollinators are going to be um, obligate because they do need each other to survive. So for this class, we're going to say that it is obligate, right? Because they do need each other and really they can't get the food source or reproduce by themselves. Okay. Um, here's some more flowers. So we're talking about flowers and pollinators, okay? Not pine cones or pine trees. Those are pollinated by wind. So those are, they don't need pollinators. Um, so here's a hum um, hummingbird, which they get a lot of the sugar um, from, um, first of all, our feeders that we leave out. But they also get a whole bunch of um, nectar from these tubular flowers. And you notice how, how they're very long, okay? So see these long necks here? Um, see the long neck and the long beak. So the long beak is able to go inside that flower and get the nectar that's deep inside. Okay. Not all pollinators can get that nectar that's deep inside there. Um, and they, and these flowers usually are red. Um, sometimes they're white to, um, attract moths at night, um, or during different seasons, um, because hummingbirds aren't always around, but, um, hummingbirds, um, they drink a lot of nectar, so they'll produce a lot of nectar for these hummingbirds, but they're also pollinators. So the hummingbird will get pollen on its beak, then go to another flower and pollinate the, the flowers. Okay, so um, very, very, very needed. So obligate still. All right, so we have another one here. So this other one is your figs. Um, if you love figs, you're going to love the story. This is actually a very special story. Um, this is one of my favorite stories of pollination. So figs, your fig newtons are made of figs, okay? Um, if any of you have a fig tree, cool. Um, now figs are only pollinated with fig wasps and fig wasps only have babies using figs. So this story is super cool. So let me um, kind of start um, with, um, let's actually start with um, the mature fig, okay? So, oops. We're gonna start with the mature fig, all right? So this is um, what it looks like. It's basically mature. It's um, basically ready to receive. Um, so, or it's ready to, oh no, it's ready to um, be eaten. Sorry about that. It's going to be ready to be eaten. Okay, so here is your mature fig and it is ready to be eaten. So the fig wasp, um, what she does is she is um, a, an adult. She goes ahead and mates, okay? So here we have some mating occurring, okay? And usually this happens shortly after um, males come out of the fig, okay? We're gonna end with, with them coming out, okay? So um, you'll find out how they, they do that. So first of all, they're gonna mate. She's gonna get pregnant, okay? So she's gonna have um, some babies, but first she's actually going to um, go ahead and go to a fig. So here is, um, some young figs, okay? Now, this is where um, we have young figs and they're in this stage where all these little flowers are inside the actual, um, see how these are little round structures? All the flowers are actually inside. So you can't actually see the flowers. The flowers are only seen by the wasps, actually. So this is really crazy. Now, now get this, imagine giving birth this way, okay? So this little fig wasp, so they're super tiny, actually goes inside. So see this little opening there? So that, that's like the mature one. But when they're really, really small in this picture, the wasp is actually going to squeeze its body into the inside of the fig. Now, she's it's such a tight uh, fit that she actually rips off her antennae. So here are her antennae and her wings. So that hurts. That's body parts, you guys, being ripped off. It's like ripping your arms off. Like, like that hurts, right? So she's actually going inside there, and she's actually never going to come back out. So she goes inside, and she lays her eggs, okay? Now, she ends up dying, 
Okay, and her babies continue on. And what happens is through these this stage, okay, we're gonna go through this stage here. The female flower um the female flowers are the ones that are um first to be um available. So there is actually a whole bunch of female flowers, okay? Now she actually has a whole bunch of pollen that's already on her. So she moves around and lays all her eggs. And actually what she does is she's pollinating the fig with all the pollen. Okay, where does she get the pollen? I'll tell you. Okay, so that's coming. So um, she already pollinated all these flowers. Okay, they're all in the female. So all the females get pollinated. Um, there's, there's a pollen that goes onto it and goes inside the actual flower and uh, pollinates and there's seeds in there. Okay, so they become um, seeds uh, because now they've been pollinated. Okay, so um, we have the flower getting sperm and meeting the egg inside the flower's um, ovary. Okay, so um, what happens is the little babies end up um, coming out of the eggs, wiggling around. Okay, and then they end up developing into um, into uh, adults. And now we have this male phase. What that means is we have male flowers. The male flowers have all that pollen, all those yellow specks of pollen um, that actually sprinkle all over the adults. So when they emerge, when the babies emerge into adults, and what they do is they actually tunnel themselves out of the fig. So they actually make this little tunnel and they come out of there, but they're full of pollen because now there's a whole bunch of male flowers and they're full of pollen. And then what happens is they mate and they go off and the cycle continues. Um, so again, the only way for a fig to get pollinated is by this fig wasp doing this. This is insane. I mean, I mean, that's like a crazy story, right? Um, and the only way uh, for the, the female, I mean, the, the fig basically goes in there, the babies are protected inside the whole entire time. And then they um, basically get into adults and then they're going to find their own fig. Now get this, there are different species of fig wasps and there's different species of fig. For every fig, there is a species of wasp that will actually um, be its species, meaning those wasps will only go into those figs. So if one of the fig wasps goes extinct, then there's no way for that fig species to get um, pollinated by that specific fig um, wasp. So um, basically it goes out too, okay? And the same way the other way, if that fig goes out, then the fig wasp will not do as well. Um, so um, this is definitely obligate, okay? They're both needing each other in this story. Hope you enjoyed that story. It's a pretty cool one. All right, we're coming to an end soon. Um, that was the longest story. Um, I just feel like that was like the craziest, most craziest mutualistic relationship. So here's another one. These are yucca trees. Um, these are mostly in deserts. Um, actually, in Joshua Tree in Southern California, there is a huge um, area down there called Joshua Tree, and they have a whole bunch of these, um, what they call uh, Lord's Candles is a common name, but they're really called yuccas. And they're very, very pointy and very, um, they pierce your skin, okay? But anyways, they have these um, flowers up here, these, these white flowers, okay? Ah, my pen keeps moving the PowerPoint forward. So there are these um, yellow, um, very beautiful, I'm sorry, yellowish white flowers, okay? And here is a yucca moth inside the flower on the right, okay? This is a huge blow up. These guys are super tiny, smaller than your pinky's um, nail, okay? They're very, very, very small. They're, they're super cute, super small, and they're all white, okay? Um, and what they do is they actually pollinate um, the yuccas, okay? So they are the only pollinator for the yucca flower. So the only way that the yucca flower gets pollinated and has more yucca babies, basically, is by the yucca moth. And the yucca moth gets protection inside the flower, okay? So we're gonna call this one an obligate relationship because they are, um, the, yucca, the yucca itself cannot be pollinated any other way 
okay? Um, and also the moths do get some pretty good production and some high survival. So we're going to say that this one is obligate. Okay, this is obligate. All right, and now we've reached our final slide. Um, so what else do plants get other than pollination? They also get us eating their fruit, right? And um, if you've ever thrown a fruit anywhere, <laughs> you know, uh, kick something around, um, you're actually helping spread its seed. It, it wants to go far away. So it makes its fruit nice and yummy for um, critters and for us to basically take their fruit away from the home plant, from where the plant originally is. Take my babies away and give them another life somewhere else, basically. That's what the plant wants, okay? It doesn't want to compete with its babies. So um, there you go. So there's um, birds that disperse them pretty far. There's bats. There's all kinds of dispersers out there. Anything that eats fruit, basically, okay? So all fruit comes from the ovary of a flower. If you're wondering your fruit versus your vegetable, your vegetable is basically anything on a plant that is not coming from a flower. So that would be, it doesn't matter what color it is. It could be, it could be green, it could be orange, yellow, whatever. Um, cucumbers are actually uh, fruits because they have seeds. So really, if you think about whatever is supposed to have seeds, some, some things are seedless now, right? We've made that happen. But if they're supposed to have seeds originally, that is technically a fruit, okay? Because it came from an ovary of a flower. Um, leaves like spinach leaves or celery, which are stems, um, roots, um, stems are also potatoes. There's the, there's your regular potato that's actually from a stem. And there's also your um, roots. That's just like your carrots and your, um, there are yams too. Yams are actually um, roots, okay? Um, storage in the roots. So those are all vegetables, all right? So that's just a cool little fun fact for the end. All right, so the mutualism type for this is that um, this would be uh, facultative because they can actually get, all these guys can get their food other ways um, through other fruit maybe, um, but they do need to eat. Um, so, um, and also the plant could technically just drop its seeds nearby. They may not do as well, okay? So we'll go with facultative with this one, um, but, you know, um, because they they're really can do well, but it's just not the best. Um, they do a lot better by having um, nice, tasty fruit and all these organisms get to eat, basically, um, instead of eating something else. Now, for some organisms, it might be obligate because that's all they have to eat. Um, but since we're going to do this like as uh, more simple, more general, we're going to go with facultative because we're going to do a blanket um, overview, whereas the majority of seed dispersers are going to be facultative. So we're going to go with facultative. All right. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson and I'll see you in the next video.